DeQuinn, let's start here. You know, again, I, I talked about this yesterday. Um, I've just met you here in the last couple of weeks, and you, and you were gracious enough to come on board and help us with our hockey camp and, and yeah. come speak to our kids about your message. And it was interesting because a mutual friend of ours, Jonathan Anderson, mm-hmm. kind of you know put us in contact, and, and you called, and I was so excited. I knew you as a football player. I yeah. didn't quite know your story. We often think we do know a guy's story, right. and then you don't know someone's story. Yeah. And what was amazing to me is we're sitting in there talking to 12-year-old young hockey players who are trying to make their way in life, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where you started. Um, yeah. Let's talk about it. At 12 years old, you you weren't playing football. You weren't playing hockey, were you? No, man. Um, I understand that I got a very unique story, and you know, that's why I try to go out and do my best to make a difference. Um, you know, I grew up in the inner city of Compton, California, in um, some crit projects, and I got involved with gangs at a very young age. And, um, you know, with my father not being around at that time, I kind of gravitated towards the streets, and I had a lot of older people who I looked up to that were doing, you know, a lot of bad things to get money. And um, I kind of just you know, chose the gang life, you know, for like an extended family. And, um, you know, when you grow up in it, it doesn't seem that bad because you really don't know anything else. You know, I, I was so messed up in the head when I was younger. I, I would think that you had to go to jail in order to get, you know, put muscle on and come out buff. So, um, you know, that's kind of where I was mentally. Um, at 12 years old, I, I caught a case and I went away for four months, I believe. And, um, you know, that was very hard on my mom, you know, with her baby boy just being gone from the home and my sisters, you know, who one is four years younger than me. The other one is eight years younger than me. And um, with my mom being pregnant at the time. So, yeah, it it was it was hard, man. But, um, you know, I learned a lot from that experience of just being, you know, 12 and looking up to the wrong people in my environment. And, um, you know, I, I really wouldn't change anything that happened in my past because I feel like it molded me into the person and the man that I am today so that I can go out, you know, to these awesome programs and charities that you put together and and go out and pour my soul into the youth because, you know, I was was one of them, if not worse. And um, I didn't have no hope, and I felt like there was no future, and I felt like that this is all that it was. And if you made it past the C21 years old, you know, that was a super blessing. So, um, yeah, that that's kind of what I was involved with, you know, just at the age of 12. And that's what I grew up, you know, around my whole life. You, you hear that word cycle used in conversations sometimes with, you know, social issues. Yeah. You were an example of that because I mentioned your first incarnation or uh, incarceration was mm-hmm. at age 12, but it was the first of three, right? Yeah. You know, it was, it was the first of three. I went to, I went to jail again, um, Four, when I was 14 years old for um, nine months, and then I went again when I was 17 for 16 months. And I was the last time I did, it was um, in California Youth Authority, which is a very rough place. Mm. And, um, yeah, man, I just continue to it's, – it's so hard to really change when you go back into the same old environment and you're around the same people who are doing the same old things. So um, one thing I knew that – what helped me out was, you know, trying to get away, but it's hard because you got a guy who you grew up with and he's your best friend. You call his mom, mom, he calls your mom, mom, but you know, you guys really ain't doing anything to prosper yourself in life. And, um, while I was in the jail cell and doing all, all this crazy, all these crazy things I was doing when I was young, I was putting my gang and my friends over my own mom, you know? And, when I was doing all these things, I was hurting my mom more than I was hurting myself, even though I was the one that was in a jail cell. So yeah, it was, it was real trying, man. And it it was very convicting for me. I felt like, you know, what kind of man would put his mom through this? Um, What kind of a man would make his mom bus all the way through Compton and some, you know, gang affiliated area, gang affiliated areas to come and see him in court. And, um, you know, that that was hard. And my mom would bring all these clothes thinking that she was going to bring me home because the public defender would say, yeah, you know, he has a good shot at coming home. And then, um, you know, the, the judge slamming, you know, slamming the um, case on me saying that I'm going to be sentenced to 16 months. It's very trying on a mom. And, 
you know, when you hear your mom cry and you hear the mourns just coming out of her voice, it's it's something that you never forget and it's something that you would never want your mom to experience. And especially knowing that you're the one that put her through that, you wouldn't want to do that to her no more. So um, that was a big changing point for me. I, um, you know, I'm just going to go on and just tell my story, Rob. So, um, you know, from that point on, when I, <clears throat> I came home at the age of 18, um, when I came home, um, my cousin, I met my cousin. I haven't saw him since I was probably 11, 12 years old because of the things that I was getting into as a juvenile. And his name was Herschel Dennis. He went to University of Southern California and um, he was on a full scholarship and he came from, you know, the projects in Long Beach, California. So that right there just gave me a little bit of hope knowing that he came from the projects in the inner city and, you know, grew up with nothing in Section 8 housing and mom was on food stamps. You know, the same thing as my mom, but he found a way to make it out. And um, he br he would bring me around the USC campus. He would show me around the players and the guys would come up like, yo, DQ, you know, you play football? And I'm like, nah, man, I don't even play, man. They're like, man, you need to play. You, you know, you're big because of all the workouts I would do when I was incarcerated. Um and one day I got a phone call from one of my buddies as I'm living with my cousin Herschel and he went to Los Angeles Harbor College. Right. And he said, Hey man, you know they're you know, they're paying they're paying me to go to school um for financial aid and I'm getting all my books and everything taken care of. And I was like, Wow, for real? And he was like, Yeah, man, you should come and, you know, just see if it's for you or not. And he was like, I give you a ride and everything if you need it. So, um my mom, she moved to Long Beach, um, about four weeks before I came home from jail. So um, I told my mom this. I I would spend a lot of time with my cousin. Then I went back and, you know, spent some time with my mom. And I told my mom this, like, hey, mom, um, they said that they're giving money out for financial aid to go to junior college. And um, I might go over there and try out for the football team. And she said, baby, you know, you can do whatever you believe yourself. Whatever, you can do whatever you want to do. And I believe in you 100%. And just her having that belief in me, you know, it just, it made me feel some kind of worth, you know, worth that i would never really had for myself in the past because, you know, there weren't a lot of people who believed in me. And even though that I was causing my mom all this pain, you know, you would think like, oh, DeQuinn, he's just telling me mm -hmm. one of his stories that he's not going to follow through with again. But, um, you know, she had full faith in me and in my capabilities, and she believed in me more than I believed in my own self. Um, so when I went and enrolled, I, accident I ac accidentally came across the football coach walking out of the administration office. And he's like, hey, son, you know, do you play football? And I'm like, no. He said, well, you know, we're having tryouts coming up in three months. And he said, we would love to have you there. You know, you look like you got the size. He said, the only thing I ask is that you take care of your grades right now in the winter. And um, you come out and you give me 110%. So I, I, I couldn't wait to get home to tell my mom about the opportunity that was, you know, coming my way. And um, when I told her that, you know, she was just happy for me and she just really wanted me to follow through with it. So um, from that day on, man, the next day I came home from school, I started watching sports channels and I didn't know what position I was going to play or anything like that. <laughs> like I didn't even know what getting down in a football stance sure. was really. Um, so... You never played it in high school? Never played. I played a little bit in Camp Kilpatrick uh, when I did my second and bid. people would know that from... Um, the Gridiron Gang? Right, the Dwayne Johnson movie, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. So I played a little bit in there, but, you know, kind of bounced around, defensive end, tight end, linebacker, and uh, I really didn't, you know, play too much, though. So uh, this was going to be like my first full year mm -hmm. of physical football activity, and... Um, so, yeah, when my mom moved, I I would um, come home and watch ESPN Classic, and I would watch Jerry Rice and Walter Payton, and they would run these hills, and they would say, hey, Jerry, hey, Walter, you know, well, you know what makes you so good? Why don't you ever get tired? And they say, man, I, I run these hills consistently, you know, on a daily basis in the offseason so that I don't get tired in the fourth quarter. And if overtime came, I wouldn't get tired in overtime. So um, my mom moved next to a place called Signal Hill, like I said, in Long Beach, and it's a huge hill. And I went out there from that day on. I ran that hill five, six days a week, and I would run it until, you know, I would be throwing up on the side of the road. I'd be very dizzy. I'd be pale walking home. 
um, cars would be pulling over like, excuse me, are, are you okay? Like, do you need a ride home? And I'd be like, no, I'm okay, you know. Uh, but that's how hard I was pushing myself. Yeah. And with me pushing myself that hard, it showed me how hard it was to be successful at something. Um, I've never worked that hard in my life. And um, when I reported back three months later and I was on top of my grades, I um, I was, you know, the best conditioned guy out there, basically on the football team. Um, I was in very good shape and I looked a lot different from when the coach saw me the first time. Um, and that's just coming from running hills and, you know, doing backyard workouts. I wasn't really hitting no weights, push-ups, dips, stuff like jumping jacks, burpees. Um, and uh, that year, man, I just continued to work hard. Coach, coach started to show me some Olympic lifts and things of that nature, got me more explosive. And then I was the number 15th player in the nation after that season. Oh. I had um, scholarship offers from, you know, everywhere in the nation. And um, I was going on recruiting trips and things like that out of the state and first time being on a plane. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I got to see, like, how bad it was <clears throat> where I was from. Um, I went out to places like Kentucky and uh, just seeing how beautiful it was, how nice people were to each other, su Southern hospitality. And I was like, man, you know, where I'm from is, is it's rough, man. Yeah. And, um, and then I went up to Oregon on a recruiting trip, really liked that a lot. That's who I thought I was going to sign with. And uh, my good buddy, Chris Matthews, he plays for the Seattle Seahawks now. His father was like a father mentor to me. Um, he was an LAPD, and he would always show up to the games and, you know, give me advice and encourage me and, you know, take us out to eat sometimes after the games and, you know, really just pour into us and invest in us. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, I really think it would be a good move if you go up to Chris, if you go up to University of Kentucky with Chris Matthews. And uh, I was like, yeah, man, for sure. You know, he's my, like my best friend up here. Right. Um, but at the at the same time, I didn't want to because I saw Oregon, I saw the uniforms, <laughs> and they was winning a bunch of games, and I wasn't too far from home. Sure. So my mom really ended up making the final decision for me. Um, you know, ever since I was young, she would always tell me, whenever you don't do what I tell you to do, something bad happens to you. And um, that's something that's instilled in me today. Whenever I don't listen to my mom and she gives me, you know, a good pointer on advice, I really try to listen to her and, you know, the things that she's trying to get across to me through her message. So uh, she met the coaches. Um, she cooked them dinner. They came to the house and we sat down, we ate, and uh, she just felt like that they were going to be a fatherly figure to me uh, when I went off to University of Kentucky. So, um, yeah, when I went out to University of Kentucky, that's kind of like when everything started to change. Mm. Um, I got there, me and Chris, we were in the dorms just for the summer se um, semester. And then from there we uh, moved out um, and they gave us money to, you know, get our own apartment and things of that nature, being on a full scholarship. And I'll never forget, uh, I, we stayed in his apartments called Newtown Crossing and uh, he had the back room and I had the front room and um, I closed my door, I locked my door and I started crying. I was crying because um, it was the first time I've ever had my own room. It was the first time I've actually got to, like, close the door and, you know, have my own bed and, you know, not have a bunch of, you know, my sisters, you know, laying right next to me on the floor or having a mattress in my living room and being having to sleep, you know what I'm saying, with my uncle or my mom in the living room. And um, it was just it was just an awesome feeling to know that I that this is finally my room, my own drawer. I was folding my clothes and, you know, putting them in my drawer and stuff. And I couldn't believe that it was mine. So, uh, you know, that was probably one of my most memorable um, experiences in college, to be honest with you. Um, you know, from that point on, I knew that I had to continue to work extremely hard to get a starting position on the team. I worked my tail off from there. I got most outstanding first year player a huge poster on the side of the uh, on stadium. I had billboards and stuff up. That was so cool for me because, you know, a kid coming from Compton, I really never expected all this, especially getting into football so late. And um, the following year, I tore my shoulder up. And, um, you know, I really didn't have a hot season, just didn't have the confidence with my shoulder hurting me so bad. And I met um, my beautiful wife, Jenna, who was running track at the time there and had the 400-meter, um, still has the 400-meter record there. And, um, you know, we started talking my senior year, her senior year as well. 
um, had a lot of things in common and didn't have a lot of things in common and just ended up being real, real good friends, trusting her, introduced her to my mom on my senior day. And um, we just, we've just we been together for five years now. I just got married last year in July. And, um, you know, it all, it all just kind of was coming together. So right after I got done with my senior season, I got a phone call from uh, the Cincinnati Bengals saying that, you know, we would like to bring you in for camp. And, you know, a lot of people knew it was a long shot for mm -hmm. me to make the team. And, you know, they always bring camp bodies in. So I came in there and, you know, I knew, I said to myself, I said, you know, make it extremely hard for Coach Lewis to send you home. You know, come in here and just give it everything that you got on this football field each and every day, no matter how you feel, you know, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on at home, no matter if they're going to give you an opportunity or not, you know, you got to go out here and make a way out of no way. So um, I just went in there and I just worked my tail off every single day. Um, you know, older guys telling me to calm down all the time. I'm getting into fights on the field because, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm scratching and clawing just to mm -hmm. just to make this team. And one of the reasons is because I was scared to go back. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. want to go back to where I'm from because um, I know what it feels like. Once you know what it feels like to really come from nothing, you don't really ever want to go back there no more. And, um, you know, that was something that really drove me. You know, just remembering my mom, like, when she would come and see me and, when I was <clears throat> locked up and I was fighting my cases and, you know, getting into fights in a holding cell because, you know, it was some of my enemies who were bloods back there. And, you know, I would come out chained from head to toe with a muzzle on my face. And, you know, it was it was extremely hard for my mom to see those kind of things. And, you know, those are the kind of things that drove me every time I touched that football field. So, um uh, that year, you know, when they called me in for camp for the Cincinnati Bengals, I had a real good preseason, and I led the team in sacks and um, tackles for loss during the preseason, and I ended up making a practice squad, which was, which is an, a huge blessing. You know, put some money in my pocket. You know, um, it showed me the ins and outs about professional football, uh, but not only that, it gave me an awesome platform to go out and reach out to the communities. You know, you, everybody wants to you know, a football player to be around, a professional guy to be around. But it was different for me. You know, I just really used my platform to try to go out and make a difference because I said I know I know what it's like to be in these kids' shoes. I know what it's like to go to sleep hungry. I know what it's like to provide, you know, for your family at the age of 12, 13 years old. I know what it's like to be a man of the house um, and to be a brother and a father figure to my sisters even though sometimes I really didn't know what I was doing when it came to fathering. You know, I, I know what it's like. Um, so, yeah, um, that was something that was really heavy on my heart. Um, and I would try to do the best I could to to use my platform, you know, just to, to give God the glory because he's brought me out of such a horrible place. So, um, yeah, from that point on, man, you know, my wife and I, we got heavily involved in a local church there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we got heavily involved in, you know, going and speaking at schools and things of that nature. And then um, I ended up staying for an extra two and a half more years. So I was there for three and a half years total. And uh, from there, I came up here last year. I won the Great Cup my <laughs> rookie year here. Like, man, I, I couldn't have been better. Yeah. And then now I'm, I'm coming up on my second season. So, um you know, I, I say all that because I don't I don't want no credit for any of that. And I don't want to nobody to be like, oh, man, you got such an awesome story because I get prideful when I hear things like that, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for God, I, none of this would have ever happened, you know, for me, because I have so many friends who are way better than me, you know, and just never even got an opportunity who's who've done the right thing. Right. So I, I, I strongly believe that God has had a plan for me. Um, even though that, you know, I wasn't doing things in a godly way. So, um, yeah, so now, um, you know, I just use everything that I've been through to try to tell young kids, like, I know that way, I've been down that way, and that ain't the way to go. Because a lot of these people, they see these movies and they listen to these songs and they mm -hmm. think that, you know, this is the way to do it, to disrespect women, to go out here and it's okay to sell drugs, to make a living. But, um you know, you're not going to be as lucky as those people who are actually talking about it and the people who are actually talking about it in these raps and in these movies really aren't doing it. 
So it's just a uh, mind manipulation that I'm trying to get out of these kids that, you know, in like the same, do the same thing that your volunteers are doing yeah. to try to really show them that there's a better way and they can make a way, you know, out of no way. Because um, there were so many people who ripped me off and who would never even think in a million years that I was going to make it to where I'm at today. And, um, you know, I'm not that. I'm not never a type of person who would be like, uh, look at me now. I showed you I can do it. No, I'm not like that. The main thing I do is I just continue to keep grinding to see improvements and um, continue to, you know, let all my positivity pour out to the next generation because I believe that's really what it's really all about. You know, you wake up to, you know, be a better football player. Um, do you wake up to, you know, be a better businessman? Do you wake up to, you know, be a better radio host? Um, you know, that's awesome. But in, in the long run, what are you doing to make a difference in this world? You know, you got so many kids and so many people out here hurting who feel like they have no way. And, um, you know, what are you doing to, to show that, you know, somebody really cares about you? Are you, what are you investing your time in? And I feel like, um, you know, those, those are some of the things that I need to be doing and that I'm continuing to do. And those are the things that are of true importance to me. You know, money come and goes, comes and goes, and um, as long as well as relationships too, um, things they come and go. But when you pour out love in the kids, and you never know, or people in general, and you know, I go on and do a lot of stuff, and you know, people who are in jail, you never know what kind of outcome, you know, just with your testimony, an hour can do for a kid's life. Telling the kid, hey man, I believe in you, man. You know why? Because I was in your shoes before. Um, taking them out to, you know, go grab some lunch or something like that. That's what it's really all about. You know, all this football stuff is going to be, it's going to be gone and over with. And to be honest, I'd rather somebody know me for making a difference in this world than being a Super Bowl champion, a Grey Cup champion, a, the most best football player in this world. Mm. You know, I'd rather be known for a man of integrity who, who makes a difference in this world. And that's kind of um, what I feel like God has prepared me to do. DeQuinn Evans of the Calgary Stampeders. A couple things that I'd like to ask you about. One, because it's, I hate to use the word glorified, It's it, there's a Hollywood element to it, but you grew up in a gang life. Yeah. You were a crip. Yeah. How difficult was it to, A, exist in that world? Yeah. Be, you know, and how difficult was it to exit that world? Because something tells me that that, you know, isn't an easy thing to do. No, it's not. Um, it's not, especially, you know, when I got my father living in the same neighborhood, um, to this day, but, um, you know, I did a lot of bad things to give me a lot of street respect back in the day. Mm. And, um, you know, so everybody knows, you know, I'm, I'm still, I still, I'm still real, you know, there's nothing fake about me at all. So when I get on the phone with cats who I grew up with, you know, I just let them know that, like, hey, man, you know, if you can't be happy for me, you're not my real friend. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm out here trying to make a difference, you know. And if you want me back in that neighborhood doing the same old things that you're doing, then, you know, you're not my real friend. And um, a lot of the people who I grew up with and who aren't in jail or who aren't dead, you know, they understand. And, you know, they, they pull for me because they're a little older now, you know. they're You know, I hung around people who were older than me because I was always big for my age, and mm -hmm. that's the kind of crowd that I blended in with. So, you know, you got guys who are in their 30s and, you know, they understand and they got kids now. So, you know, they understand. Uh, you know, there might be a couple of young guys who don't know me, and but I, I really don't care about them, to be honest with you. You know, my, my whole thing is, you know, I'm, I made it out of there and I'm trying to make a difference, you know, not only where I'm at, but back there when I'm done playing football. So, um, yeah, it was hard growing up in that. It was hard because you're always trying to please somebody. And even doing the most craziest, respected thing in the neighborhood, it still isn't enough to please somebody. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, what have you did for me lately type thing. Yeah. We don't care about what you did in the past. You know, we living in it now. What have you did for me now? And then, like I said, to get out of it, the only way I really could was to to leave. You know, I had to, I had to get out of my neighborhood that I was living in um, and I had to move my family out. So, um you know, that was that was very hard. When I went off to college, you got to think about it. I'm the man of the house. Now my mom is kind of by herself, and she has to raise three baby girls by herself. And, 
you know, you, you know as well as I do, when you don't have that man structure in the house, it's, you know, things can kind of go sideways. So it's kind of hard having a relationship and, you know, trying to discipline, you know, your own baby sisters in a way that you're showing love over the phone or over Skype because they know that they can just do what they want when, mm -hmm. you know, that phone call is over with. So, yeah, man, it's, you know, those are the kind of things that I was really worried about. I really wasn't worried about, oh, how am I going to get out of this gang? I was worried about, man, what is my family going to do now that I'm gone? Yeah, that's what I want to ask you about because you, you, in your story, your mom shows up a lot. Yeah. One is, you know, I think everybody wants to ask the, the silver bullet question to Quinn. What, what was that catalyst for change? And I don't know if it's one thing, but it sure seems to me like it was your mom. That, you, that your yeah. mom played such a, a, a pivotal role in this. Yeah. yeah, man. If it wasn't for my mother, man, um, I don't know, you know, where really I would have got my drive from hmm. um, because money wasn't the motivation for me. The motivation was putting a smile on my mom's face and, you know, knowing that she was going to be worry-free of me because I was on the phone with her the other day and she says, you know, I just want to, I just want to thank you for, <sighs> excuse me, man. I just want to thank you for um, not having me up all night and um, wondering if those sirens are going off and um, thinking if that's going to be my baby boy in, in one of those ambulances. Um, you know, you bring me so much peace now from, from where you were before, and I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because I can't explain to you <clears throat> I can't explain to you how uh, how worried I would get and um, all the sleepless nights I had when you were out there in them streets. And I think that that's, uh, that's the biggest uh, compliment I've ever got from my mom, and I think that that's the biggest payoff. Um that a man can ever receive. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you really can't, you really can't, you know, words can't portray what your mom, what you put your mom through, you know, and, um, and I'm just glad that I don't have to, that she doesn't have to, go through any of that no more and I'm glad that you know I'm able to provide financially for my family now and um and I'm glad that uh my sisters can see what a real man is and uh they know how they're supposed to be treated by a man from the way that I treat my wife and they, they understand like the uh the importance of, of making a difference in this world, man. And I think that that's, that's what it's really all about, Rob. You know, I get really emotional talking about it because I forget about the illustrations, you know, that are stuck in my head. And and I forget about, you know, a lot of the things that, that, that went on. And, um, you know, when I sit here and I share my testimony, it's helpful for me, too, to talk about it because... You know, it um it helps me to continue to strive forward and continue to to fight the good fight. I I might <clears throat> I might be off a little bit on this, so bear with me. Yeah. But from a, a sports standpoint, for an elite athlete, for someone to make the NFL as an undrafted player, yeah, to have never played high school football, yeah, something has to elevate you quickly in the game. Yeah. We talked yesterday about, you know, there's no shortage of elite athlete opportunities for kids. Kids are forced into, they get camps all the time early on. We can take care of the kids. No. You didn't have that. No. Am I connecting the wrong things here, but the passion, what you're talking about, the attempt to get out, to make your parent, your mother proud, to do the right things, that's what got you to the NFL and the CFL. Not, yeah. I mean, you're a great football player. I'm not taking that away. Right. But it's not the skill set as much as the will and the drive and the desire. It's all about the will. You can train as much as you want. You can 
take whatever supplement known to mankind. You know, you can meditate all you want. You can, you know, see who you want, who's a sports psychologist. It doesn't matter. It's what's in you and what drives you to line up when it's fourth down with snot coming out of your nose and you know that they can't get the first down in a big sack of, you know, stop them right here and right now, and you you put your fingers down and you're shaking in your stance because you just don't have no more energy and you, you're nauseous from playing extremely hard the whole game, and then you still go out there and give it your all because you feel like the person who's lined up in front of you is trying to take food from your family mouth. And um, that's kind of like how I approach the game. And I said, uh, you know, anything, if I can go through all this in my life, you know, I will never leave an ounce of effort on this field. So when I'm done playing football, you know, I'm, I'm drained from everything that I have. You know, it's I'm walking real slow. I leave everything that I have out there. And you can ask any coach that, uh, you know, has ever coached me that would tell you that, you know, DeQuinn Evans is the hardest working guy, you know, I've been around. And um, that can go from my junior college coach to, you know, De Devon Claybooks right mm -hmm. now. You know, one thing that, um, you know, I, I try never not to do is when a coach puts on film on me is they'll never have to say, oh, DQ, come on, man, you got to run to the ball. You know, that'll never happen because uh, I feel like no one should ever coach me on effort. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just kind of like, I feel like you can portray that into life in general, not only sports. You uh, you take that to whatever you have a passion for and you find out, you know, why you're doing what you're doing and it'll help you excel in whatever kind of phase of life that you're in. Um, and for me, it was my mom. My mom was the motivation, um, not the motivation just because she was there for me, you know, her, her whole life and my whole life. Um, the motivation because I've seen what she had to go through and the struggles she had to go through and, you know, the men and, you know, just the sleepless nights were not having no money and, and things like that. And I feel like uh, if I can, you know, do anything to help my mom and this football thing is going to help me get there, then, you know, I'm going to do everything that I can in my will and in my power to make sure that, you know, we'll never have those kind of nights and days again. But it all comes from deep within you. You know, how bad do you want it? If me and you are on a treadmill right now, I can guarantee you I'll die on that treadmill before I come off and me and you running together. And that's just kind of the um that's just kind of what's embedded in me. So it all comes from the why. Why do you do what you do? Yeah. If you um want to play football because oh, I just love to play football, uh, I would say, man, look for a deeper reason than that. Because there's so much more that you can get out of your own potential if you find out a better why than that. Football ends. This does not. No. How do you, what, what are your plans? Where do you go in life? Because this is, this is not a hobby. This is not someone who's coming in and selling me something. This is no. who you are. This is a calling. This is yeah. your testimony. Yeah. How do you carry that beyond you know, a football career, which is still, please still has lots and lots of years left, but yeah. this can't end with that. No, man. No, definitely not. Um, one of my big dreams was to open like a, a big brother, big sister program, but like taking it to the next level, you know, in inner city areas as well as Compton, California. And, um, you know, just finding people who are as passionate as I am about, you know, changing the mindsets of these young men and women and letting them, letting them know there's so much more um, than where they're from. Um, doing something like that, um, getting involved, um, you know, in any kind of def um, detention centers, um, being around um, things that I'm familiar with, high school uh, football teams, junior college football teams, um, going to speak to them and invest time into them. And then, um, you know, just meeting people, going out and networking with people who – you know, have the same kind of interests and ideas that I have. And, you know, we'll kind of just see where it goes from there. Um, I feel like God will take care of the rest as long as, you know, I keep going out here and, and doing my best to um, make a difference.